coach. Let's find out if you're ready for love. Here's your marvelous host, Nikki Lee. Hello, and welcome to Ready for Love Radio. This is your host and love coach, Nikki Lee. Today, we are going to tackle a tough subject, but another one that I, I really feel that people need more information. And sometimes you just need an anonymous place to get information about the, the Rolling Stone article that's now been basically completely debunked, I really wanted to tackle some information and get some information out to the listeners about sexual assault, understanding what it is, what it's not, uh, what it's like to deal with the legal system. There's there's a law in California about uh, affirmative consent. We're going to talk about that a little bit because it's becoming more prevalent across the country. How to support survivors. And I'm going to be really careful not to use the word victim. I hate thing victim. So it's definitely going to be survivors we're going to talk about today. And some information about false reporting, which like I said, falls right in line with the, the Rolling Stone article and, and what happened with that. So what I did is I reached out to a local organization uh, in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, it's called the Sexual Assault Resource Agency. And I'm talking today to uh, their crisis services coordinator, Taylor Starnes. Taylor, it's awesome to have you with me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, like I said, I, I wanted to go to a go-to person that I thought could help, and I saw y'all being interviewed on the news. I'm like, that's who I need. <laughs> so, so I think that you can share some information that's going to be really helpful. I did a bunch of research, so we've got a lot of great info to share. And let me go ahead and say, too, um, I am going to be including quite a bit of this information and links to more information on my, my website. So anybody listening... After the show, go to uh, lovecoachjourney.com slash sexual-assault. It will be there. And if, and if you don't remember that, just go to uh, lovecoachjourney.com and type in sexual assault in the search box, and it should come right up for you. There's going to be lots of resources for you to take a look at. So, Taylor, do you want to just tell the audience a little bit about um, what you do and why you got into the work that you're doing? I'd love to. Um, so my job at Sarah is crisis services coordinator. So basically I oversee our two main crisis response programs, um, one of which is our 24-7 hotline. Um, so we train volunteers to be on the hotline um, and offer that constantly so that members of our community can get support whenever they might need it. And then the other big piece of our crisis work is 24-7 emergency room response. So that means that at any time, if a person goes to the hospital after a sexual assault, um, one of our advocates will be paged, one of our staff members will be paged to come in, make sure they understand their options, um, kind of support them through the process, that sort of thing. Um, So that's what I really do with Sarah. And as an organization, we exist in the community to provide free and confidential services to survivors of sexual assault um, and sexual violence in general, um, and also their friends and families for whom these experiences can be really, really tough. And then we also provide prevention education, outreach, and training um, to schools and other organizations in the area. Awesome. And I really got involved okay. in this work. I, I can, When I think about maybe the pivotal moment for me, um, I was starting to hear a lot more about sexual assault in college, when I was in college, um, and that's when the conversation about assault on campuses really got started. Um, And I was standing outside of my dorm, and they were reading kind of every year, the dorm advisors would read this statement to everyone about all the new rules and things to do and not to do with this, that, and the other. And um, this is a pretty direct quote from from the resident advisor. She said, the sexual assault crisis line has been discontinued due to lack of funding, period. And then after that immediately said, we've introduced a new service that will send you a text on your cell phone when your laundry is done. And it blew my mind. It blew my mind that my small liberal arts and liberal in general college um, would fund something so trivial um, as a laundry text alert system um, while pulling funding from something so important and serious. And that's really when I kind of honestly got got full on started in the work um, in school and then moved into the field when I graduated. You know, it's it's interesting how something happens usually in, in our personal lives, and that's when it's like, hey, wait a second, I got to do something to make this better. 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, that that would that would have taken me back too. That unreal. <laughs> they would it do was. that. I don't think I'll ever forget it. Uh, well, uh, evidently it made an impression. <laughs> so, which is good because see now you've landed in in a job and you have a purpose and you're helping people. So that's awesome. Okay. So so what I think we we talked about this a little bit before. Y'all actually classify a lot of these sorts of things that happen to people as sexual violence. And just to kind of set the stage for what we're going to talk about. How do you all define sexual violence for a person? Okay. So first of all, we say sexual violence so that we can kind of incorporate all sorts of different experiences folks may have, um, may have had, anything from child sexual abuse to rape or sexual assault as an adult. But our kind of working definition of sexual violence would be um, that it's conduct of a sexual nature that's non-consensual and that it's accomplished through threat, coercion, force, or physical or mental incapacitation. Okay. So are there are there some basic misconceptions that people have? And I think maybe one of the big ones would be about stereotypes. Maybe stereotypes about the sort of person that's a, that would be, um, and I'm going to use that word I can't stand, but might be a, a victim of rape or some other kind of sexual violence or the kind of stereotype about the kind of person that would commit an act of sexual violence against another person. Right. I think we have a lot, a lot of stereotypes um, in our culture about sexual violence. But the biggest one, I think you're right, um, comes down to our understanding of what it means and the kind of people who who perpetrate it. Um, So I don't know about you, but I was raised with this kind of understanding that, you know, rape happens when you're walking home at night alone and somebody comes out of a dark alley with a weapon, right? Um, right. And that's, that's kind of what we're taught to fear, and it's what we're taught, you know, in kind of the prevention methods that focus on risk reduction, right? Like, don't walk home alone at night, don't talk to right. strangers. All of those things are only really about that kind of sexual assault. Um, and what we know is that actually very few sexual assaults are committed by strangers in those sorts of circumstances. Um, it's really below 5% that are. Um, and over 70% are committed by acquaintances, so people that the person knows pretty well before before the assault happens. I think that's a huge um, misperception that really is limiting us in terms of what we're doing to prevent sexual assault, um, what we're doing to provide services to survivors, and really in the movement as a whole. Right. Well, you know, in... I was I was looking in, in my research. I, I found a survey that was done, and it it broke down. It was for a police department in San Diego, and it was talking about from seventy two to seventy six, three quarters of the assaults were by strangers. Okay, but then if you flash forward to ninety two to ninety six, they did another another survey of of the information, and they showed that that almost eighty percent were people that they knew. So it has radically changed in what's happening, and and like you said, so many people. They just they just assume it's going to be you know it, it couldn't possibly be somebody that you know or somebody that you're dating or a family member or that kind of thing and that's a much bigger thing that people need to be aware of and on the lookout for you know whether it's whether it's parents with something happening to their children or us individually or or any any kind of person that could be involved. Absolutely, and I think the most harmful thing about that stereotype, well, one of the harmful things, like you're saying, is that it prevents us from. Um, from understanding the actual risk, right? But the, right. the most harmful thing in my mind is that it prevents victims and survivors from getting justice and services because True. if they don't feel like they have that airtight story of a stranger in an alley, if they don't feel like they have the story that they've been told is the most important and most real and most valid story, um, then they don't feel like they have what they need to, to go forward and, you know, pursue the criminal legal system, get support services, et cetera. Um, I think that's the biggest the biggest problem we have when it comes to that stereotype. Well, you know, one, one of the things I was looking at actually has an entire section called Recognize the Consequences of the Misconceptions that uh, Society Has. Mm-hmm. And, and they include basically what you just said. In fact, victims are not believed. Uh, cases are not investigated properly. Mm-hmm. Assaults that look like the stereotype are the ones that are prosecuted, not others. And offenders can repeat their crimes because that couldn't possibly be that kind of a person. You know, they would never do something like that. You know, any, anybody is capable of anything. 
is what I've pretty much learned throughout life at this point. Absolutely. So not only have we been taught that there's, you know, a perfect victim, but we have this understanding of perpetrators as these, you know, deranged people hiding in the bushes or hiding in the alley, when really these are people who probably function pretty normally in our society. Um, when it comes to campus sexual assault, I think we kind of started talking about this a little bit um, in discussions of UVA and assault at UVA, but um, it prevents when we have this understanding of perpetrators as these kind of really strange, isolated, problematic people, we can't believe somebody who says that, you know, this man who is going to school, has a job, comes from a good family, all of these things. We can't believe a person who says that that person hurts them um, because it doesn't fit our understanding of what a perpetrator looks like. But, um We have to accept it, that clearly perpetrators are leading pretty normal existences in our society and and getting away with what they do a lot more often than not. That's true. I mean, how how often do you see a report, you know, either TV news, you know, print media, whatever, and and all the people that knew them goes, well, I can't believe that that person would do something like this and they were such a nice person and, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, it's it's very rare. Or some of them go, oh, well, I knew, I knew, you know. But the majority of people can't believe somebody they knew that they've interacted with, even if they saw things that should have been signs or red flags. They just don't put together, you know, two and two that, that this person could be a danger. Mm-hmm. I know we we just went through that with with a lot of the news coverage um, with the Hannah Graham disappearance from UVA, and so many people. I mean, there there were all kinds of red flags if you if you really read the information, you know, the detailed stuff. But people are like, oh no no, he was harmless. Well, no, maybe not. Well, yeah, and I mean, what a great case to show us um, how much of a problem it is that perpetrators on campuses aren't being um, brought to justice, right? Because this person was essentially allowed to escalate by the system, repeated. Yes. Yeah. And he yeah. did. Um, very, it's very, very unfortunate. Very definitely. Okay, so let's talk about the legal system and what a survivor should expect and and just kind of, I guess, kind of what what's the norm as far as the legal system? Because I know, you know, if you watch TV and, and you, you watch Special Victims Unit, which I really enjoy, you know, although I, I know there's a lot of things that aren't right about how they, they you know, put things out there. But what should a person expect if they are assaulted and they are considering going to the police? What's, what's realistic for people to expect? You know, it varies. Um, but the, the biggest thing I think people should um, expect, and it really, I think that, you know, I watch Law and Order SVU too, and I think that a lot of the misconceptions people have about how investigations and prosecutions go kind of come from our exposure in the media on CSI and SVU. And the first thing I would say that people should expect that maybe they wouldn't expect based on those shows is that it takes a lot of time. It takes a very right. long time. Um, so... You know, on SVU, you see them come into the station a few hours after the assault, and they say, you know, the rape kit was positive or the rape kit was negative, right? Um, right. DNA evidence takes up, up to six months to come back, um, at least in our state. So that's just not what happens. Um, someone's in for a long haul. The trials, if they go, you know, if the case goes to trial, they should expect over a year, really, um, before that process is kind of full and complete. Um, so I think people need to understand that for sure. What about the, do do many assaults actually, I mean, even if they are reported and investigated and they, they do find evidence that, that a, per, a specific person did um, commit this crime, do many of these actually go to trial? No, and I'm glad you brought that up. Um, the truth is that a lot don't, especially with adult sexual assault cases. Um, Assault of of people who are under 18 is a totally different story, right, because the law is so different. Um, But a lot of cases don't go to trial, to give you an example. Um, And this has been very frustrating as advocates in the community to see people saying, why don't they just call the police, right? Why aren't these women just calling the police? Um, But to give you an example locally, not a single adult sexual assault case was taken to trial in Charlottesville in um, the fiscal year of 2000. Um, 2014. That's just unreal. <laughs> it so, really is. So that gives you an idea. And it's for a lot of reasons, you know, um, a fair amount of the cases don't make it past the investigation stage. And I know that our Commonwealth attorneys 
communicate a lot with survivors about, you know, what their best possible outcome is. And they do their best to kind of keep from re-traumatizing people in the process. Um, and another thing we need to understand is that certainly a big portion of the case is not going forward is because a survivor doesn't want to proceed with the system. Um, just doesn't feel like they can prioritize that in their lives um, and would rather focus on their healing or something else. Um, and then a fair amount in the plea agreement. Um, that's, that's something that happens a lot. Um, and that can be helpful in some ways, right? It might mean that a survivor wouldn't have to testify, but we don't see a ton of these cases actually going to trial. Hmm. Are, are there many plea agreements? Yes. That's good. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I, I I would think not having to go to trial, not having to relive it, not having to testify. You know, telling telling individuals is one thing, but testifying in open court that that's a whole different ballgame. Absolutely, you know? repeatedly as well. You know. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the things you see on on SVU is is the person going to have to tell you tell it again. You know, and then they have to in court also. Um. I mean, there's there's certain things that that you know we just don't want to talk about in public, and I that would certainly be one of those things. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, please, I'm ha- glad. To, and when, when you told me about the no uh, no prosecutions, but okay, so I, I feel better now that there are plea agreements going on. So that helps. Yeah, you know, and obviously the, those might be reduced charges a fair amount of the time. But if, if you're speaking to a survivor and their their desired outcome is, you know, I want this person to at least do some time. I want them right. to at least be on the sex offender registry. You know, that, that can be considered a success in that case if, if the victim or survivor feels like they've gotten what they need from the process. Um, and not Very true. have the freedom to move on with their lives. Well, I think with me, a lot of times it's the person needs to be held accountable. You know, they they've... My, I'm like that about everything in life. You know, if if you're going to do it, commit to it, take responsibility, and then be accountable, whether it's good or bad. And and that's the thing too. If somebody does something and breaks the law, and in this case, physically and emotionally, you know, harms another person, they need to be held accountable in some way. So that is very definitely, you know, when I was I was looking. One of the things I found was was a list of things for a survivor to um, consider or to be aware of. In case it does go to trial, and of course, they, in case they do have to take the stand, and this is great. I just want to hit a couple of these things real quick. It says, um, "Know your limitations. You know, take take brief pauses if you need to. Stay hydrated. You know, bring a bottle of water. You know, so that you can you can take sips of water while you're testifying. You know, keep your eyes focused on the person asking the questions. Don't look at the perpetrator. Don't focus on them and their attorney." Um, Remind yourself that you have the right to tell your story. Trust your memory and your feelings. Let me see. Um, if at any point you're feeling overwhelmed, ask the prosecutor or the judge if you can take a short break. Remember the de- defense attorney is taking is doing their job, and they are going to come after after the person. I mean that that's pretty much a given, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And find out if there's a safe, quiet place to wait in the courthouse. That's big. I was recently in a situation with a friend of mine um, where they had been accused of something they didn't do. And, and just having to interact with the people that were filing the charges and, and their friends and their whole entourage, it was unreal for us. And, and we hadn't even been through anything else. You know, just the people that were there, there to support and, and to testify. So, I'm, you know, I, I could just imagine that, that that would be radically ramped up in this kind of a situation because you've got all the all the emotions and, and all that sort of thing happening in addition to, you know, if you're just there to support another person. Okay. So just just some good things I thought were good for people to, to know and to consider beforehand. Yeah, those are great suggestions. And I would really encourage, one of the things that we do at Sarah is um, we call advocacy. So our advocates mm-hmm. really help support people through the legal system. Um, right. And they'll meet with them. And victim witness coordinators can do this in most jurisdictions. There's a victim witness representative whose job it is essentially support um, victims of witnesses through the system. So they're oh. great about doing things like, you know, taking you to the courtroom ahead of time so you can see what the layout is, um, you know, preparing you for the types of questions that might be asked, finding you a, a quiet place to wait um, in the courtroom. All of those things make such a huge difference to people. Very true. 
I tell you what, I think I think our conversation about affirmative consent may go a little long, so I want to kind of jump around a little bit. And let's talk about what friends and family can do to support a survivor of sexual violence. What are, what are some tips that you all offer? And then I, I got all kinds of neat little notes here for some things that I, I thought were very, very helpful. Right. Um, you know, there's a group at UVA, um, a really great student activist group called One Less, and they give this really short and sweet list of things to say to somebody if they disclose to you, and I really like it, so I'll repeat it. Um, but the first thing they say to say is, I believe you, um, which That's is really big. important. I think people underestimate the value of that statement. Um, so I believe you. And then the second thing, it's not your fault. That's Another okay. very undervalued statement. You know, we might assume, of course they know it's not their fault. Um, or, you know, someone else has probably told them it's not their fault. Um, but it's, it's something that everyone needs to hear. Absolutely needs to hear. And then the third thing is, how can I support you? Um, so asking the person to let you know what it is that they would like you to do to support them. True. And people are people ask me all the time, you know, what what's the exact thing that I should say? And certainly our hotline volunteers ask me that a lot when they're speaking with people on the hotline. And I try to remind them that um, it's not so much about saying the, the exact perfect thing in that moment. It's really more just about being present with that person and being, you know, a non-judgmental, supportive listener. Um, because people want to talk to people, you know. They don't expect you to be a, a robot or a computer with this perfect response. Um, True. So presence is so is so important, and 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 being kind of just sitting with the person and listening non judgmentally and supportively um, is so important. Very true. Well, and a lot of times you you don't really need somebody to offer a suggestion. You just need to know somebody hears you, that somebody's willing to listen. Because sometimes you just need to vent. You just need to get it out. Absolutely. And I think and especially the, the you know not being judgmental that's huge. And I th- I think one thing too. Is if don't don't make up things if you don't know the answer, you know, and don't don't think that you have to talk nonstop. You know, sometimes just being quiet and listening is is really what the person needs the most from you. Definitely, um, you know, we we remind people that silence isn't a problem, and I think that it you know it comes from our desire to help, right? When someone starts right. talking to us, we just want to give them a response, you know, give them an answer, help fix the situation. Um, it's a lot more difficult to step back and say, you know, I'm not going to be able to do this. Um, so how can right. I be supportive of this person? And like you were saying, the non-judgmental piece, um, the biggest, the biggest um, place that that comes in when it comes to listening to survivors is not not pushing them into anything, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, not pushing people to immediately call the police and get that process going. Not pushing people to immediately get into therapy and start, you know, healing um just letting people, you know, maybe presenting them with information, but letting them make their own decisions about what they want to do next is so important because it returns um, some of the control that's been kind of taken away from them in the process of, of the violence that they've experienced. That's right. Well, and the person needs to take back control of their own life. They need to feel like they're in control of their own life. And so, I mean... You, like I said, a lot of times you don't really need the other person to fix it. You just need to know somebody's there, believes you, is not being judgmental, and is there if you need them. You know. So, um, well, and one of the things that I found too is there was some things for the the support system or the people that are trying to support a survivor. And one of the things is understanding it's normal to be upset, angry, and confused. That's normal, mm-hmm. and especially if you really care about the person, because there probably is nothing specific you can do to fix the problem. You can be there to support, you can be there to help, but you can't fix it. You can't undo it. Right. So just be supportive. Um, let me see. <laughs> he says you might have a strong urge to do something or to tell the, the person that, that they have to do something. They, they don't don't force them. You know, they, there's been enough force already inflicted on the person. So, you know, you might want to, you might wonder if there was something they could have done to prevent the rape or, or any other kind of assault. You know, that that's something, I don't think that's helpful to, to vent that or to voice that to the person. You may think that, you may wonder that, but, but don't say it out loud. It probably occurred to them, right? 
Um, right. And, and that's upsetting and devastating that, that it does occur to people since we hear so much victim blaming that it, it ha- of course, survivors, victims and survivors blame themselves too. Um, so avoiding anything that might, that might remotely suggest that they did something wrong. Um, exactly. It's so important because there is absolutely nothing in this world that you can do to deserve this sort of experience. Absolutely. No, there is not. Well, and I think don't, don't belittle what they're feeling or, or what they're experiencing or what they're going through. Because, you know, unless you've been in the situation, you don't know. And even if you have, it could be a very different situation. You know, it, it could be like, if, if it's a complete stranger and, and that sort of thing, or, or if it's somebody that you were very close to that was a family member or, you know, a trusted friend of the family, it's very different dynamics depending on the person and the person that assaulted them. So, you know, don't, just don't ever think that you know what they're going through because you probably don't. Absolutely. And I'm glad you brought that up because people kind of think sometimes that there's one way that a victim or survivor might act or react, right? Right. Um, and the truth is that the responses are as varied as people are. You know, yeah. it, it, it's as different for each person as we all are different from one another. Um, so allowing people to feel what they're feeling, telling them they're entitled to feel that way, yes. you know, that it's okay <laughs> that they feel that way, um, is so important. Well, this is the, another thing is the desire for revenge or to do something to lash out to the person oh, yes. that that did this to your friend or family member, that's very normal. You, you shouldn't do that, you know, let, let the people that, that, you know, are in, let the legal system or the police or whatever handle that. But feeling that is normal. So just understand that, you know, you're, you're feeling that way and, and the survivor's probably feeling that way also. So... <laughs> it's it's do anything that might make the situation worse for them, right? Because we certainly hear that expressed a lot. Um, Very true. It's, it's amazing the things people say without thinking that really make the situation worse for everybody. So I think, you know, if something pops in your head, kind of think about it before you voice it. Don't just speak off the top of your head without thinking first. That's a great suggestion. <laughs> you know, should be a no-brainer, but, you know, you got to say these things. So... <laughs> Oh, gracious. And, and all of this is just don't ever feel that you have to have all the answers. Mm-hmm. That's big. Mm-hmm. So, let me see. And I think, I think this is going to touch on some of it, but there was, there's a great list, and I'll, I'll include a link to this on, on the site too, because there's just so many things. But it said, just say, how can I help? What do you need? Mm-hmm. You know, like, like we've said, don't, don't force what you think the person needs on them, ask them what they need. And if they don't know, they don't know. But you know what? They can tell you later when they do know what they need from you. Right. Um, let me see. Tell them that you appreciate that they felt they could trust you and, and tell you what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, I think sometimes don't don't press for more details than the person is willing to give you. Maybe maybe they just need to, to share it, it in pieces. Does that make sense? Absolutely. That's something I'm always reminding people. Um, it can kind of be our nature to ask questions when somebody's telling right. us the story. Um, and I tell our, vol- our hotline volunteers and anyone I talk to, don't ask a question unless you need the answer to best help or support the person. So, right. And the example that I give is, you know, um, if you're going to ask somebody when this happened, well, that's a really important question if they're considering getting a forensic exam, right? Because in Virginia, right. you can only get them um, 72 hours after the assault. So that would be a question that you're asking for the specific person purpose, excuse me, of helping the person. Um, but unless you really don't need that answer to support them, then maybe maybe not asking the question is the better thing to do. That's it. You don't need all the answers right now. Don't have to have all the answers, and you don't need all the answers right now. And be patient. That was a big one. Let the person do this on whatever time frame they personally need to. Don't rush the situation. Um, let me see. It says, be sensitive and understanding about the person's decisions. And one of the things that I, I saw in, a, in an interesting article from a woman that kind of fell under the legal process was after the fact how many ways revealing to people that you have been assaulted, how it impacts your social life. You know, maybe 
maybe people don't look at you the same way or they may overanalyze what you do thinking, you know, that you're not behaving the way you should. There, There is no the way you should. <laughs> you know, every single person is going to react in a certain way. And maybe, maybe what one person perceives as, you know, not acting like you should is trying to get your life back on track, trying to get control of your life again. Mm-hmm. So it, 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 it all boils down to not being judgmental. Don't judge what you don't understand. Um, and healing. Healing is going to take time for the person. There again, you, you can't rush it. You may be able to offer suggestions, and you may be there to support them and help them, but you've got to let the person heal in their own time in the way that's best for them personally. Mm-hmm. Definitely, and that comes back to that kind of control factor. Um, right. And it's, it's a consent issue, really, too. You know, um, we at there won't, won't serve somebody who doesn't want services. You know, we, we don't... Um, serve people because the court is demanding that we do or because a family member demands that they receive therapy, you know? I mean, it, healing needs to be a consensual process. That's kind of the point um, when it comes to addressing what's happened to somebody. When it's been something nonviolent, or excuse me, violent and non-consensual, um, they really have to have the freedom to make their own choices when it comes Very to Very true. Life. Well, and, and haven't you found, too, that if, if the person isn't ready it's not going to be nearly as beneficial for the person. I mean, you have to be, you have to physically and mentally and emotionally be ready before any of that kind of thing helps you is, is what I've always seen. Absolutely, absolutely. So we wouldn't want somebody to get forced in, you know, say, to therapy before they're ready and then have a bad experience with it and right. then never go back because they feel like, oh, I tried that, I didn't like it, it didn't work. Wouldn't we so much rather that person wait until they feel ready and then go have a positive experience and get what they need out of it? Very true. Very, very true. Okay, now let's let's tackle this affirmative consent. Okay. And you you mentioned that to me. Was was what you're thinking the the new laws that they have in California, and then it seems like a, a lot of the campuses around the country are now starting to, to adapt that to it. We, we are talking about the same thing, right? Yes, we are. Okay. Just okay. <laughs> wanted to make sure. <laughs> if not, I did all the wrong research. <laughs> okay. Because that's, that's our consent standard, Sarah, you know, and has been for a long time. Um, we don't believe that consent is a lack of a no or a lack of a fight. Um, we believe that consent is something that's expressed actively. Um, and it's been really interesting to see it kind of unfold in the legislation that's coming out on campuses. And a lot of campuses have adopted that standard. So UVA, for example, in their newly released um, sexual misconduct policy has an affirmative consent standard now. Um, it's certainly controversial, which in some ways I understand and in some ways I don't. Um, part of me feels like you know, the, even the, the thought that it's so ridiculous um, that somebody would have to ask permission before they touch your body shows right. how much of a problem we have in our society. Because to me, it seems ridiculous that somebody could assume that they have access to my body until I tell them no, right? Right. Um, so it's been a really interesting conversation to kind of observe in the media. Andrew, well, I, I hadn't even heard of it until you mentioned Then I started researching, like, how in the world did I miss all this? <laughs> but I, there was there was a whole lot of different perspectives, and I found some articles for and some against, you know, what was wrong with this and why does it work and that kind of thing. And one of the neatest, I just I want to make sure I share this, one of the neatest comments I saw was from a law professor at George Washington University. And he says, I don't think the problem is the definition of consent. The problem is that too many guys simply don't take no as no. They're either drunk or stupid, that his words, not mine, <laughs> or have been conditioned by our society to believe that no means maybe, and that if they keep pressing, the no could be turned into a yes. In most states still, for it to be rape or assault, the guy must use force or threat of force, or the woman must be totally incapacitated. That's what needs to change. We have to have the unified understanding of consent and that should simply be that no really does mean no. Isn't that awesome? I like that. It is awesome. And I and I agree with him. You know, we've a lot of um we've been having kind of the consent conversation for so long and a lot of the new newer activism is saying, you know, it's not 
the definition is not the issue, exactly what this person is saying, that the people who are committing this violence really don't care about definitions. Um, So arguing (laughs) semantics with them is probably not going to prevent them from assaulting people. That said, it's pretty important um, since our law, all of our legal recourse in this society is based on words and definitions. Um, It is important that they change and that they reflect what we know about these crimes and that they reflect perspective that allows people to get justice. Um, But at the end of the day, I I certainly don't believe that the vast majority of perpetrators are just confused, right? Um, Right. I think that these are are people who are committing acts of violence against other people. Well, another thing, one thing too, is, is people don't grasp and, and this is not just everybody. This is just there are there are people in society that don't grasp. It's not about sex. It's mm-hmm. more about violence. It's more about control of the other person. Yes, yeah, absolutely. You know, that's, so that's, when you go back to kind of stereotypes and misconceptions, that's such a huge one in our society. It is not about sex. True. Not sex gone wrong, right? The dynamics are totally different. Exactly. Totally different. Exactly. Well, and did you see, this is a little bit off topic, but did you see the, the video or, or read any of the news articles about the uh, woman that was assaulted on the beach in spring break in, in broad daylight? Right. And there were like all kinds of people that filmed it, they recorded it, but nobody did anything? It's horrifying. I, I, unbelievable to me that those kind of things can happen. No, it's absolutely horrifying. But, uh, wow. But it does show you how kind of normalized that violence has become in our society, right? Um, it did. That those kinds of things can happen, and they do. I just, I, well, and, and this is a whole topic for another show, but I, I think it's more the devaluing of a human life, you know, or devaluing the other person or the sense of entitlement. I'm entitled to what I want, and it doesn't matter what it does to you. And I, that's horrible. Horrible that attitude. word entitlement is very important. And when yeah. I kind of watch the campus sexual assault dialogue happen in particular, you know, you hear, oh, well, it's college and people have to learn these sorts of boundaries. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not a learning experience. Um, sexual no. assault is not a learning experience. Um, it can't be because the stakes are too high. You're talking about the testing ground being another person's body. You know, right. we can't, we can't, we can't tag that up to a learning experience or something that's um, normal or something that people need to go through so that they understand. <laughs> that was like a solid thing. It's amazing what turns up on Facebook some days. But somebody had shared a story about, I think it was a bishop, that that didn't said, said that he didn't realize it was against the law to have sex with children. Okay, look. You know, even, even if you're so completely out of touch that you didn't know it's illegal, there are so many other grounds that should make you realize this is something you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. I I don't know. Uh, I don't know. People just astound me in a very bad way sometimes. (laughs) But um, one of the deals, and, and I kept coming across this with the whole affirmative consent, was that you can either verbally or non-verbally give your consent. And it seems to me non-verbal consent is opening up all kinds of potential for misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we're seeing now. You know, I think that that's the reason that, you know, what people are missing is that this affirmative consent push is not, you know, some radical feminist overreaction, right? (laughs) It's come out of the fact that we've learned that our standards now aren't good enough, that it's, that people, um, that what we're doing now is not working, right? That this idea, the the need for a no, or the need for a struggle, is not is not working. It's protecting people. Um, so we're asking for affirmative consent so that there's more clarity, um, and so that people can better understand what what the rules are and what they need to do before engaging in that kind of contact with someone. That's true. Well, one of one of the examples that was kind of humorous, and, and the person that, that the law professor that did the quote that I like so much, one of the things he says is is how difficult this could become because you're supposed to have initial consent, and then as as the um, encounter, shall we say, um, evolves, and and you know things become more passionate and move to to you know a different level or, or however you want to say it that you're supposed to have ongoing consent, which that's a little confusing, too. 
Right. So I, I love his example. I, I just, this, I'm, I'm a fan of this guy already. <laughs> he says, he says, how would this work in real practice? Okay, suppose the guy says, may I touch your breast? Okay, does that mean through her shirt, over her bra? Does that mean he can touch her bare breast? Does it mean he can touch it with his hand or with his lips? What if this all happens in succession? As things escalate, is he supposed to ask, say, 20 or 30 different questions to make sure what he's doing is okay? You know, so so how does ongoing consent work? Is is there a real understanding of what that is? You know, or one of the things was saying, you know, if if the pace or the rhythm of what you're doing changes, you have to ask. That's just not feasible. So, yeah, I'm I'm all I'm all for uh, you know a an adult consensual couple having all kinds of interesting talk and exchanges you know during during sexual activity, but there, there's also being realistic <laughs> and does this work? Can this work? Right. Um, and I think this is another piece that comes out of what we've <clears throat> seen go wrong. And what we've seen go wrong is that countless victims and survivors say, you know, I agreed. You know, I was fine with making out. But then this right. happened, right? And that's where we've said, okay, it needs to be ongoing. You can't say, well, they did this, so that meant that I could do whatever I wanted from there on out, because we're seeing that happen in so many cases. Um, so that's kind of where the ongoing piece comes from. And, you know, it's really not this idea of every two seconds saying, you know, can I do this, can I do that. It's so much more about checking in with people as, um, you know, different acts or different types of um, a sexual encounter might might happen, right, as the situation changes, checking in with somebody and making sure that they're okay. Um, and it's, 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 I know it seems complicated now, and it might be at first if, if this were to become more broad law, but I think that it really is important, you know. Um, people are saying now, well, this is so ridiculous, now I'll have to prove that I got consent from somebody. Um, well, as it is now, victims and survivors are having to prove non-consent. They're having right. to prove force and coercion, and that's just as ridiculous, and it's not working. Um, so a lot of a lot of the movement with affirmative consent is just based on, you know, this is what we're seeing happen. Um, so we're trying to do something different um, that will hopefully keep a lot of what we've seen happen from, from continuing. You know, I, I keep, as, as we're going over this, I, I keep seeing in, in my head the whole first base, second base, third base home run, <laughs> yeah. you know. It's like, okay, so as as you move past second base, as, as you step off and you're going towards second, ask for permission, you know. Right. I don't know why that keeps but popping in. we have to say that. it, you know, because if we don't, <laughs> then somebody assumes, okay, well, if they said yes to this, then I can do whatever I want. And and no one wants that. No one really believes that that should be okay, you know. Um, that, so we, we have to start spelling these things out, and it may seem or feel ridiculous to people, but it's where we are. You know, um, it's where we are, and the statistics of, of violence are way too high. They're unacceptable, um, and something's got to change. So that's that's where this this shift is coming from. We know this this is probably way too conservative of to, uh, of me, but if if you really don't have any clue about the person, and you really feel that you would need to ask forty questions, maybe you're not ready to have sex with the person. Possible. You know, <laughs> is, is that just me? <laughs> I, I know, way, way too conservative, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, it definitely, definitely puts a slant on the whole uh, intimate interaction with another human being kind of, mm-hmm. kind of thing. I don't know. Well, and how does how does being drunk fit into affirmative consent? Because I know that's been an issue that that if a person is incapacitated with with the laws as we have them now, they cannot give consent. So does that also roll in, over into the affirmative consent? Absolutely. Um, well, and it is so complicated, right? You know, I can't count how many times I'm, pre- you know, in a presentation presented with a hundred different alternatives. Well, what if this, that, and the other? And you can kind of go down this rabbit hole with intoxication and incapacitation. But the bottom line is people need to understand that the laws say, the laws and almost all of the university <coughs> policies, right, say that a person who is intoxicated is incapacitated and cannot consent. Um, that's the bottom line. And you know, it would seem, and I can't remember if I was just thinking this at three this morning when I was looking over this or if I really read this, but it would seem that 
if you can't give consent if you're drunk or, or incapacitated some other way, then you're not qualified to get consent if you're drunk and incapacitated either. Interesting. What do you think? I haven't thought about it from that from that angle. Okay, maybe it's just popping what I hear. <laughs> you know, what if both people are drunk? This, that, you know, and I'm sure most of the uh, most of the time in the college scenarios that is the case, right? Yeah, right. Um, and I just have to come back to you know, we can go through as many as scenario as many scenarios as you can come up with. But the bottom line, people, is that if they were drunk, this is what the law says. Um, so keep that in mind. That's true. I'm just thinking if if you're impaired in any way from alcohol, drugs, whatever, you're, you're not perceiving the situation the way it really is. Mm-hmm. So it, w- it would be hard to say, well, I was I was really, really super drunk and I was seeing triple, but yeah, yeah, she said yes. Well, you know, <laughs> you don't know that. Right. You really that, don't. And that's the one thing they're sure of, right? Out of the entire uh, exactly. Time, they can't remember this or that, but they remember, <laughs> they remember <laughs> that she said yes. Uh, uh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. What about false reporting? Okay. So, um, yes, definitely something that's been in the news lately. And false reporting, first it's important to know the difference between, um, and this is what the police actually call a false report, which is an unfounded report, and an unsubstantiated report. Ah. So an unsubstantiated report would be a report where they really can't prove either way what happened. Um, And a false report or an unfounded report means they can prove that this was made up, right, that this was not true. And so the latter, the false reports, are actually really, really rare. Um, Two to three percent is is the statistic, that's being generous, that that comes back um, the most often in the research. And that's lower than almost any other crime. It's lower than false reporting of car break-ins. It's lower than um, false reporting of arson and robbery, all of those things. And we hear about false reporting pretty much only in the context of sexual assault. Um, hmm. So I think that that actually encourages us as a society to ask ourselves, what is it about this crime? What is it about these victims, these people, um, that we question so much when we don't apply that standard to everyone else? Interesting. You think it could be that because so many are he said, she said kind of things, and they just figure that proving it is going to be complicated? Sometimes, and I think... You know, a lot of it has to do with just values in our society and back to those big ideas of entitlement you were talking about, right? Um, Devaluing people based on different gender stereotypes and and ideas, all of those things. And honestly, something that I say a lot is I think the bottom line is it's a lot easier to say that person's lying than it is to sit with the reality that this happens and it happens as, as often as it does. Right. True. Um, I think we feel much better about a world where the statistics are made up and all the stories are made up and all the victims are lying. We feel better about that world than we do about the world where we're, where the rates of violence are as high as they are. Um, we feel safer disbelieving somebody because it means that, that what they're saying isn't true and that we don't actually live in a world where something so bad could happen to somebody. True. Of course, being in denial really doesn't help anybody, but no. <laughs> it's, it is kind of prevalent. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> I see I see some comments from people, and I'm sitting there going, okay, do, do you understand this is reality? You know, this, this isn't something I'm making up to scare people. This is what really is going on out here. Mm-hmm. But I, I guess we all have to accept reality in our own time and, and when we can personally handle it. Mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. I don't know. Very, very strange. Um, so, how would you classify the the UVA story that was in Rolling Stone at this point with the, the latest information that we've gotten about it? So, um, technically, you know, from the standpoint of the police, that's an unsubstantiated report. And that's the police chief was, was careful about kind of clarifying that several times through. You know, we cannot prove that this happened or didn't happen. Um, of right. course we know that certain details have, have been brought forward and it seems confusing, right? It seems like a couple of the things, at least, that were said um, don't seem consistent with, with research that's been done, investigations that have um, that have been done. But they're careful to say this is an open case. 
um, we cannot prove that nothing happened to this person. Um, right. And that makes it unsubstantiated, not unfounded. Yeah, being being this local, I, I I mean, I was watching something, one of the local channels, right when when they broadcast, and he he seemed like he was very careful. And, and Longo's really good, though. I mean, he he seems really good when he does press conferences, that and he tries to stay on you know on message. But he's also very careful in the way he words things, so as not to be misconstrued. As much as you can do that with the media, <laughs> but. You certainly can't completely make sure the media is not going to you know, misquote you, but, but he seems to do a really good job with it. Mm-hmm. Plus, he's had some really huge things to deal with on a national right. scale. he's had a lot of opportunity lately, unfortunately. Oh, I tell you what, unreal the national stories that have come out of, you know, <laughs> someplace so close to all of us. Mm-hmm. But, so, are there any, we've only got a few couple minutes left. Is, are there any, any things that we miss that you think we should, we should share with people that, um, May may be survivors of any kind of sexual violence that may be potential support systems for people who have done this, or maybe any any red flags for people to keep an eye out for potentially dangerous situations. And I know that is definitely a loaded question. <laughs> so. I would I think the thing that I would want to emphasize the most to the people listening is the importance of familiarizing yourself with your local resources. You know. Um, knowing what your local support agencies are so that you have that information for yourself or for people, you know, you care about who might need it. Um, and knowing that there are people who will believe you, who are supportive and who do want to help. Um, and that having the information that you need to reach out is kind of the most important thing that you can do ahead of time. Um, is to know Very what's true. available and how to access it. Very true. So what about, are there things that people can do in their own life or, or you know, even, even for parents or caretakers to help? I mean, no matter what, you, you can't completely eliminate the possibility of something ever happening bad to, to people that you care about or yourself. I mean, it'd be great if we could, but short of living in a bubble with, you know, no human interaction, I don't, I don't see a way we can do that. But are, are there some tips maybe to help people to be more aware. I think a big thing is people being more aware of the people that are interacting with themselves and their family members mm-hmm. and things that are going on around us. It's amazing the things that you can avoid if you're just being more aware of your surroundings a lot of time. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that education is huge, especially when we're talking about, you know, parents and children. Um and because people have those mis- kind of misperceptions about how this violence happen and happens and who commits it, they don't think about, you know, really key pieces of education that their kids need to stay safe. Um, and I'll give an example that I heard from someone at a conference recently, but she was talking about a kid who was being abused at home, sexually abused at home, and was trying to get help, and she kept telling her teacher, you know, so-and-so is touching my pocketbook. He's touching my pocketbook. And the teacher was going, you know, okay, whatever, um, and, and just moving on. And that's the word that this kid had been taught, right, for her private areas. And so she was trying to reach out for help, but because she didn't have the word, um, because she didn't have the information, she didn't get it, you know. Right. Um, and parents don't think about that sort of thing. You know, we have so many mixed feelings about sex education in our country, and that's understandable. Right. But we have got to give kids the basic tools and vocabulary that they need um, to know what's okay and what's not okay and to know how to reach out for help. Yeah, QT names for things are not going to get it when the person needs to actually convey something. No. And it's, it's so sad that she was trying She was trying to get help and, and just couldn't. Mm-hmm. Have, to give, have to give people the tools to work with to get the message across when they need to. Absolutely. I think that that's our best bet in prevention, and that's what our prevention educators focus on at schools, you know, is healthy boundaries, healthy relationships, healthy sexuality, um, because we have to increase healthy sexuality to decrease sexual violence. Yes, we do. I'm I'm all for, and, and this is something that comes up a lot in, in my show, is, is healthy relationships, healthy sexual activity, you know, there, there are ways that people do things, and there are ways that you can do things that's so much healthier and more positive for you and everybody else involved. Mm-hmm. So, 
Yes. Oh, she, and I and I get people sometimes you say like healthy relationships and like their eyes start to glaze over. I'm like, okay, sit down. We need to talk. <laughs> you know? No, it's totally true. Every on the first night of my volunteer training, I I we brainstorm and I say I write sexual violence on the board and we brainstorm, you know, and everyone has all of these words and then I write healthy sexuality and no one says a word. Right. Exactly. And that's that's a big deal, right? And it speaks to a really big problem that we have. So I'm definitely grateful for and supportive of shows shows like yours that encourage people to start talking about um, healthy sexuality and healthy relationships. It's so important. Very good. Well, we are we are out of time, and it was great to have you with me. Do you want to give out your website address so people can Absolutely. take a look? So our website is www.sarahseville.org. So that's S-A-R-A-C-V-I-L-L-E dot org. All right. And, again, for people that are listening, there will be additional resources and links that you can take a look at on my website at lovecoachjourney.com slash sexual dash assault. And, listeners, I will see you next time on Ready for Love Radio.